It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I, I note all of those uh, comments about uh, uh, the, the risk backdrop for investors now. Um, and I think what we're, we're certainly going to see is maybe from uh, some of the slides coming up is uh, actually a generally healthy picture so far, at least for, for real estate globally, although maybe some, some signs of, of slowdown. Um, now, for those of you uh, familiar with MSCI Real Estate, um, or formerly known as IPD, um, our indexes cover around 30-odd countries around the world, and we collect data directly from um, investors and managers on the properties that they own. Um, what we'll do this morning is effectively look at that data uh, to see what it reveals about the, the returns and maybe some of the risks that investors face. So um, it will be very data-driven, which is maybe not the best way to start an early morning, uh, but I make no apologies for it. It's, uh, it's what we do, and if, if it wasn't there, there wouldn't be much else. So what I'd like to, to do is um, pick up on um, five pieces, really. Um, look at uh, the performance of real estate here in Canada um, and put that into some kind of multi some context globally and uh, actually go a little bit further, look at um, some of the cities that we can measure in returns on around the world. But having done that, maybe just explore, um, at least from the data that we have, um, what we see as driving some of those returns in terms of um, vacancy rates and, and, uh, and uh, uh, investor demand. So with that, if we start with Canada, um, what the chart here is showing is total investment return from the RealPAC IPD Canada index. It's unlevered total returns comprising underlying income return plus capital appreciation. And what it's showing is that actually for the last 12 months up to uh, September, um, returns have actually sort of ticked up a little bit to 7.4%. Now they did peak uh, in 2012 from the last cycle at least at uh, just under 15% and they've slowed pretty much every year since but I think we can probably see a, uh, what you might want to think as a, a soft landing uh, for real estate here in, in Canada. But what the chart clearly shows is a, is a market that is very cyclical, um, a strong upswing into the, into the financial crisis and um, obviously, you can see the write-downs in value during that period, which, um, for the record, were relatively modest compared to a number of other countries. But we see a similar strong recovery out of that financial crisis. So if we, if we look at this, were to look at this over the very long run, performances here, total returns to investors have averaged over 10% per annum, which clearly is a very, very healthy rate of return. Um, the last 10-year number, um, a, lot of, a lot of asset allocation models using that kind of period, uh, now under 10%, under though 9.6% as we're, we're showing, and we would probably expect that number to kind of gradually kind of tail down in future years. So uh, we've got data up to the end of September here in Canada. We have a quarterly, uh, a quarterly data series. 7.4% um, was the, the national average return, but you can see retail and actually closely followed uh, by residential uh, produce the top returns at 8.5%. Uh, and, and it's industrial and, and office that are lagging behind a little bit at 67 and 6% respectively. But that's a pretty narrow spread um, across the property types. We've certainly seen much wider spreads in, in previous years. But where we do see a spread um, is in, uh, in, in the metro, main metro areas. And clearly Vancouver producing um, by far the, the strongest rates of return that we see. 14.3% um, total return for the year to September. That's closely followed by Vancouver at uh, Toronto at just over 11. But that runs all the way down to, as one would expect, uh, much weaker performances in Alberta and, and Calgary at the bottom of the pile at a negative 1.1% return. So that's a, effectively saying that all of the, the write downs in capital value have offset the income yield on property in, in the market there. Um, returns just slightly positive in, in Edmonton, but uh, Edmonton's, from our data, seems to be a, a, a year ahead of Calgary. And as a, a third pack, which is the kind of the solid group in the middle, um, returns in Ottawa and Montreal are pretty, pretty solid um, at the sort of income return plus a little bit of growth, which we can kind of see from, from uh, this chart here. Most of the returns in Ottawa and Montreal made up of income return, um, and you can just see a, a little bit of growth about the 1.5% rate for, for the last year. 
but very strong rates of growth, uh, capital appreciation in, in Vancouver, nearly 10%. So for a, an economy that's kind of slowed, we're still seeing very strong growth, uh, growth there. But also in Toronto, 6% growth in values uh, for the market, uh, the market here. But work your way down, you can start to see you know, the impact of um, uh, the, the, uh, the crash in oil prices affecting Alberta in terms of the values of real estate here. Um, um, some significant write-downs in Calgary, 6.4%, um, and about 3.5% in, in, in Edmonton. But overall, um, if we take uh, all of the properties, about $140 billion of real estate here in Canada that, that's, that's recorded, uh, the income return at 5.0%, well, that's down to an historic low. So we see cap rates driving values up and yields down again. Um, and that's supported by a 2.3% uh, growth in, in, in capital values. Uh, in uh, industrials and offices, very small uplifts in value. Most of the, the return coming through from income. But we see nearly 4% and 4% rates of growth in, in values in, uh, in retail and residential. So that's where the growth is, although there should be, that should be caveated. Um, if we were to strip out the super regionals, it's not shown here, but if we were to strip them out from the retail number, retail values would be flat. So the, con the value growth in the retail sector very much concentrated within the, in the super regional set. But if that's one year, what are we kind of seeing in terms of trends? Well, what we're showing here is um, something that's trying to capture the momentum of the different cities. And uh, along the, the, the horizontal axis, you've got the returns over the last five years, and on the vertical axis, the most recent return. And we're trying to kind of see how does that fit in with what, uh, what we've been seeing recently. And really, look, Vancouver's strong, and it, it's been strong. So it's, 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 it's continuing to kind of produce very, very healthy returns. Um, at a lower rate, um, so is Toronto. It seems to be kind of sustaining those high rates of return. But we're certainly seeing, well, Winnipeg was producing strong returns. It's, 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 it's weakened recently. But probably more importantly, we're seeing you know, confirmation that there's, there's increasing weakness in Alberta, um, particularly with uh, Calgary that's really starting to fall into that slipping and, and sluggish category. Now, the final group, again, is that, uh, that Ottawa-Montreal group, which is um, solid, um, uh, if, if unspectacular, kind of returns. And we kind of see that through the cycle. The returns don't go up very much, they don't go down very much. But um, uh, so on a risk-adjusted basis, um, certainly are more favorable than, than perhaps would uh, appear on first glance. So... So that's the kind of the picture in terms of the, sort of the, the rates of returns. And, and clearly, the story of the past decade or more has been cap rate compression. And what we're measuring here is uh, net income yields as a kind of a trailing proxy for, for cap rates and, and actually just using the, the retail sector as, a, as an example. Um, and what we see is if you look over to the kind of the, the color coded sort of chart to the part of the chart to the, to the left. Uh, you can clearly see that we've moved gradually through to historic lows um, almost year by year, really, and uh, very, much, sort of very much lower than we saw a decade ago. And if you think about this, this is an average income yield across a portfolio of retail property that we're measuring here, about $56 billion worth of real estate. And the average yield now is 4.4%. Bring that down and focus it in on Vancouver and Toronto, it's 4.1%. And again, if you went to the super regionals and the regionals within that set, it would be lower still. So these really are um, very, fierce, um, very fierce yields. Now, despite those low yields, um, we're still seeing very strong demand. Um, this is the amount of net new money going into portfolios, the 40 that we measure here in Canada, uh, about 140 billion. And we can see that four, a net new of 4.1 billion has gone in in the last 12 months. Now, retail has taken up the, the biggest... Uh, part of that in the sense of the uh, 1.4 billion out of that total. But there was also another 1.4 in the retail office and industrial sectors, so residential industrial office, and 1 billion on land investments, which must be into development, of course. But in terms of uh, location, you can clearly see that investment is concentrated within the Toronto market. So overall, we've got a picture here of call it flattish performance, still a 7.5% 7, 7 return is, is, is still healthy, um, off now historic low yields and continuing strong demand. 
and some pockets, um, big pockets admittedly, um, of very strong performance in Vancouver and Toronto. So how does that fit? How does Canada sort of fit into the context of, um, of, of, the, of the global market? Well, the data that we've got in the databases um, in, in, this, in, in these 30 countries amounts to around two trillion of, of investment by the major institutions of so pension funds, insurance companies, fund managers. Um, and if we were to combine that all together, we can kind of see the global cycle, the blue line, and we can see that up to the end of last year, uh, the return was 10.7%. So actually a pretty healthy above average return to global real estate. Um, there's nothing yet for 2016, and the reason for that is the number of markets are on effectively annual cycles, so we won't know until the early part of 2017 what the returns definitively were in, in, in 2016. But we do have some information on Canada, and we have some information on some other markets, and probably we would say that, um, well, Canada certainly lagged since the, the, um, the oil price crash in 2013. But it was actually probably fair to say coming to the end of a kind of a strong cycle in any case. So the two things kind of coincided. And certainly returns have been much lower than the global norm since that point. And uh, in all fairness, if we look at the gray lines that show where we do have some data so far, Canada's probably going to underperform again in 2016. But let's not forget, if you look back historically, you know, the yellow line is indicating that up to that 2013 point, the returns here in Canada were, were consistently above the global norm. And so uh, anybody fortunate enough to have a large part of their portfolio in Canadian real estate would have uh, produced um, very healthy returns. But if we look at the, the full rate of returns um, for, well, 2015, with some updates for, for 2016, what we see is, um, well, a range from 25% in Ireland down to Italy at, at, at 5%. So a pretty wide range across different countries around the world. Now, um, evidence we've got shows that Ireland has slowed somewhat. Well, that's not particularly surprising. Kind of sustaining 25% rates of return is clearly, um, clearly challenging. Um, but more significantly, we've seen a slowdown in well, the UK, 13% um, down to 4 and uh, probably even more significantly in the US, down from 12 to 8.8%. To so I think there's maybe some indications here that there's a little bit of a slowdown in returns uh, globally. So especially with the, the US market slowing, um, matching a 10.7 global average for 2016 is, is probably unlikely. So look, we, we, we see Ireland and Spain at the top of the 2015 chart, um, but we've got to bear, bear something quite important in mind. Um, what the chart here is showing is, uh, along the bottom is the standard deviation of returns over the longer run for these countries, and on the vertical axis, the most recent return. It's not a true uh, long-term risk and return chart, but what it's trying to show is effectively that, yes, returns may be strong in Ireland and Spain, but they're incredibly volatile markets, and we've got to kind of bear that in mind. And actually contrast that with performance on the, the more Germanic markets, if I can put it that way, out to the left. Um, in Germany, Australia, and Switzerland, returns much lower, but actually returns very stable compared to what we see in, in other countries. Um, that may well be for fundamental reasons. It may also be for more kind of technical reasons to do with uh, the measurement of real estate and valuations in those markets. Anyhow, uh, I think the main point here is that if we look at this kind of chart and you look at the white blobs particularly, um, but you could extrapolate this out in, in other regions too, um, there's a lot that separates the different countries. There's a very wide difference between what we see for Spain or Ireland or indeed the UK with what we see moving through the middle batch, which starts to become maybe, you know, the, the next stage is the sort of the Polands, the Czechs, the Hungaries, which might be the more emerging markets, and then you work down into the more stable um, or, or mature, I should say, um, uh, European markets. So there's a, there's a wide range in terms of the, well, what the returns that are being thrown off by these markets, but in also their, their inherent nature. But look, if we dig a little bit more in, into a little bit more detail now and just look at some, um, some global cities uh, returns, um, we've got information, as I say, on two trillion worth of investments, and that can clearly be sort of recompiled up into actually more cities than we, we can show here, but these are, these are the major ones. But I think the, pain, the point I want to make here is that if you just look at this, um, if you can see it at the back, 
uh, the, the color coding, if, if you like, on these global cities, you can see that there's actually a lot of var variety here from negative returns to sort of strongly positive. And indeed, there's that variability within regions too. It's within Europe. It's, you can certainly see it within North America as well. Now, Calgary obviously stands out there as a, as a, as a negative. Um, but there's been some very strong returns too. So a lot of variability, a lot of, I suppose, benefits to be had from diversification um, within region as well as, um, as well as globally. But if we put that, um, all of that, stretch all that data out for um, returns to um, June, um, give us a, a, a more complete set. Um, again, we can see this kind of wide range of returns. Um, at, the, at the extreme left, you can kind of see Dublin, 19.4, Sydney, 17.2. Um, then we get Amsterdam, 15.5, San Francisco, 15%. So some sort of strong returns there. Um, and that runs all the way down to, well, Calgary at minus 1.1% at the other end of the extreme. So to, just think about the sort of the Canadian cities within this context. I don't know whether you can see this, um, but uh, in the, certainly towards the top end, you've got Vancouver and Toronto. That kind of moves down through the middle pack to almost to the end, Montreal, and then at the end, uh, in Calgary. So interesting that sort of can Canadian cities kind of span this, um, this range of returns pretty much. Um, but down at the bottom end, yes, we do have Calgary. Uh, if you're close enough, you can probably see this. There's also Houston and, and Perth down there as well. So there's clearly weak performance from the commodity-driven uh, cities that's starting to emerge. Um, but I think also interesting as well, and actually it might actually be clearer if we go back to the previous chart. Um, uh, there's strong performance on the kind of the west coast of well, US and Canada. So San Francisco, Vancouver, Portland, San Diego, Seattle, LA, they're all kind of in that kind of strong returns. So there's clearly um, a strong kind of coastal, um, Pacific coast performance emerging, which actually if you can see, you would see that replicated in this chart here. So um, strong performances, Pacific coastal cities, weak performance on commodity-driven cities. But I think what we've got to remember is that um, these cities are subject to their own cycles. Now, um, San Francisco and Dublin are now one and four, but as you can see from this chart, they kind of ranked actually at the bottom of this, actually not so long ago. And Sydney, um, number two, it was also in the bottom half for a number, number of years. So um, these things aren't stable. Indeed, actually, as these gray lines are, uh, are hiding a lot here, and um, a good example would be sort of Washington, D.C., um, pretty poor returns of late, but one of the top performing uh, cities during the financial crisis. So these things kind of do change, and Calgary is in many ways the kind of, uh, probably the wrong expression, but poster child for this kind of volatility. And during this period, we've seen it be the best performing city, the worst, back to being the best and the worst again. So being able to, you know, a really, really short cycle in a 10-year period, which is um, which the only city where we've kind of seen that amount of volatility. And we see this in the accentuated cycle shown here, which is the kind of the rates of return um, over, over the last 10 years. Um, and that's kind of culminated in this minus 1.1%. Now, we've been talking a lot to our um, the, the users here in Canada about the performance of Calgary and there's kind of some questions about whether the, the write downs in value, which are six and a half percent, should be even more. But um, in this kind of context, it's, it's clearly the worst that we're recording globally. So um, I think that puts some kind of perspective, perspective on it. Uh, now, Vancouver, again, um, very strong performing city here in, in Canada, and it's had a, a great run in Canadian terms in, in recent years. But if you put it into a global context, um, probably fair to say, you know, middle of the pack for the last five years at least. But as I say, maybe one of the most interesting things to come out of this is that the range from Vancouver to Calgary pretty much captures the, the global spread. Now, a lot of these kind of cycles that move cities around in these kind of rankings around the world, obviously driven by the fundamental economics that impacts the um, uh, impacts sort of demand and supply in those cities, but um, cap rate trends have been a strong, powerful force as well. Um, and clearly, if we, again, this is income yields, not, not cap rates, but um, a, good, a good consistent measure of, um, of cap rate shift if lagged. Um, we see a global trend that's very much downward since the global financial crisis, so that's not a, not, not a surprise. 
We also see very fierce pricing in the main global centres, um, less than 4.5% for, for all the cities shown here, Toronto, New York, London, Paris. But what was also interesting here is, is a reflection, of, I think, is this sort of flight to, to quality. Um, you can see the tail end of the, of the, of the boom in, uh, up to 2008, where the, the range of cap rates kind of got spread, got compressed into sort of about 300, 325 basis points from highest to lowest. It's now about 600 basis points from highest to lowest. So maybe some evidence that you know, secondary cities or less prime cities um, have seen less cap rate compression than, than those prime, than, than, the, than the main global centers. So if that's the kind of the performance picture, what might be pushing or, or pulling these, uh, these return trends. Now, bear in mind the slides that you're going to see next represent, if you like, averages across portfolios of assets that we measure, 2,000 odd portfolios around the world. Um, it's not kind of new supply or take up data that might be more sort of uh, at the edge of the current um, transactions. But certainly it kind of reflects, if you like, benchmarks um, for portfolio managers and investors in, in terms of their operating performances. So um, if we kind of kick off with, well, vacancy rates. So what, you know, are, are there demand pressures in, in certain markets? Well, in some, maybe. Um, what the bars are showing here is the historical ranges of vacancy rates country by country, and the blobs are indicating um, the most recent rates, as I say, portfolio measures. Um, and generally speaking, you kind of conclude that these vacancy rates are pretty much within the ranges of sort of historical averages. Now, the main exception, of course, is the US. Um, across the portfolios we measure, there's about 250 billion of assets um, in the, the large core fund, open-end core funds there. Vacancy rates are now just above 5%, and you can see that that's pretty much down at the historic averages. It's ticked up a little bit over the last 12 months, but generally speaking, at, 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 at historic lows. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've got well, high rates in southern Europe, um, that's maybe not surprising. Um, in, Port in Portugal, in Italy, um, and in Spain, although it's, it's improving more in Spain. But if we just turn to the commodity markets, we're clearly seeing a very, cl a very different uh, and clear trend. We're seeing vacancy rates rise uh, quite markedly. You can see that um, in, in Perth. That's been a, a trend in place for a while. And... Um, very interesting to note that there has been an increase in vacancy rates in, in, in Calgary, not a surprise, but it's really sort of rocketed up in the last 12 months. And in fact, actually, if we look, it's quite a significant shift from just before the oil price um, fall, vacancy rates were less than 3%, and they've now gone up and to, to over 10% in the market. And again, I think the point here is this is kind of a reflection of the inherent volatility of, of, of the market. Now, given its impact on previous real estate cycles, or probably crashes, I should say, should say um, uh, uh, what's, um, where are we in the kind of the development um, cycles? Well, generally speaking, again, we're seeing pretty much development rates at a kind of historic low. Um, you can kind of see that in terms of where these blobs fit into the, into the bars. Canada is relatively low, 1.5% uh, of new money going into... One, as a, sorry, 1.5% of capital value um, going in as new money into development. And that's relatively low in terms of history here in Canada, and it's also relatively low in terms of uh, some of the other countries that we're measuring. So um, if you look at the global average, you can see that, generally speaking, development rates are pretty much in, in, in the middle of the range. Canada is two, three bars in from the right, and you can see that everything over to the right of, that, of Canada is, well, lower in terms of development rates but also at pretty much historic lows. So partic picture particularly muted um, in France, in Germany. Uh, in some of the larger markets, US and UK, again, okay, we're in the middle of the range, but we're not seeing any um, excess uh, de development activity, certainly within the, the institutions that um, we're measuring here. Um, come out to the extreme left, and actually there is a, maybe an interesting point here with um, development rates in the Netherlands being exceptionally high. Now, typically, for the institutions at least, there's not been much development going on. But after the, um, the global financial crisis, the, the Netherlands recession was, was, 
um, quite lengthy, if not as severe as we saw in southern Europe. But it's finally pulled out and we're seeing an in, uh, a substantial increase in, in development activity by the institutions, particularly as you can see here in Amsterdam, up to 5% of capital value now going in, in in new development. And overall development in, in the Netherlands at nearly 4% is only surpassed by that in, in, uh, in South Africa. So finally, um, turning to capital markets, key driver in uh, the performance in Canada over the last, what, 10, 15 years, driving income yields down from sort of 10% in the, the late 1990s to, to 5% now. Uh, and what we see is, I think, a, a still a strong appetite for, for real estate, although it's interesting to note, I think there's been a slight fall off in, value, in volumes in the, in the major cities. And um, this is data from Real Capital Analytics, analytics so thanks to, uh, to Bob White and his team for, for letting us use this. Uh, it's, it's showing that um, the volumes in these global cities um, are still large, um, about 180 billion in transactions uh, in, uh, in, in the year to date. But perhaps reflecting some of the uncertainties that we heard about earlier, the political backdrops for 2016, uh, and certainly that's uh, highlighted in the, the fall in volumes, unsurprisingly, uh, in London, which has now kind of slipped down to, to number four in this global city's ranking. Now, the market was slowing in any case um, before um, the, the, the referendum, um, but we did actually see our data this time uh, falls in value of 2.5% immediately after the, um, immediately after the, 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 the result. So overall buying um, activity across our sample of 2,000 odd portfolios remains healthy, um, certainly remained healthy up to 2015. Uh, as it says here, about 7%, 6.9% um, of new money going into portfolios. A little bit lower than we saw in 2014 and in the, uh, in the boom years, but, but still resilient. Uh, Canadian funds, interesting here because it looks as if they are below par on this metric, at sort of an investment of about 4% going into the portfolios. But um, bear in mind this is only domestic investment. If we were to add in the investment that's made outside of Canada, which has obviously been substantial for the large pension funds, um, then you know, we would see... Can, Canadian funds being an a, a, a above average investor in real estate. And that, is, that investment has clearly driven yields down in Canada, as I mentioned earlier, um, down to historic lows. But it's also true pretty much everywhere. Uh, certainly our global average, that shows a, an average income yield of 5.1%. As you can see, that's down a historic low, down from a peak of 7.7%. Uh, it's true for the US, UK, Japan, France, Germany. All of the major markets are kind of seeing pricing at, at, at record levels. I think you have to kind of maybe go to some of our Asian sample to see yields where they're not down at those historic lows. So maybe less, less pressure as, questionably less pressure as interest rates rise. But I think what's also maybe interesting of note here is that if you look at the size of the bars, there's three countries that stand out. And the bars indicate how much cap rates or income yields have moved over the past decade. Um, one is Ireland with a massive uh, boom and, and, and crash and recovery. Um, but the other two are Canada and the US. So not necessarily indicating cap rate volatility, it might do, but certainly it does indicate how far uh, cap rates have come down in those markets. But um, well, finally, um, as the chart says, and finally, and as the chart says, it's all relative. Um, now, the appeal of real estate, evident from the capital flows we've seen um, into the portfolios by our data, from real capital analytics data, and the appeal of it as a relatively high yielding asset class clearly remains. Um, while we've seen markets driven down to historic low yields, the spread over government bonds is indicated you know, for just for these kind of six sample countries is at least somewhere around historic averages. And actually, if you go to maybe APAC, you'd even argue that they're above average. So if you're looking for kind of cushions in terms of um, real estate relative to interest rate shift, um, you know, clearly uh, we're not repeating what we saw back in the boom years where the spread uh, between government bonds was pretty much bid away. So um, I see Jacques come down to the front, so I will, um, I guess that's my cue to wrap up. <laughs> um,
But um, yes, yeah, so just to, to wrap up, record pricing clearly, we're seeing um, record low income yields in pretty much all markets that we're monitoring here. Um, but relatively, real estate still attractive. Canada looks to be below par um, again. Um, um, although we are seeing this wide range of returns within the country from Vancouver down to, 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 to Calgary. Um, but generally speaking, I think may, you know, a resilient picture for sort of the global markets we're measuring, although maybe some evidence of uh, slowdown emerging. So with that, thank you. <laughs>